Welcome in to the Bobby Carver Show featuring my man, Joshua Perry. We're going to be joined today, too, by my man, Anthony Schlegel. We've got a big weekend uh, here in Columbus, Ohio. Big week with the Arnold Classic getting rolling. And you know Schlegs. He loves a good meatball setting, so that'll be perfect for him. He also celebrated a big birthday on Mar March 1st, so we're excited to celebrate that with him. A lot of news. Got some combine talk. Changes in rules in college football where – I mean, I guess we're just merging it straight up into the NFL now. Um, going to also talk about some of the biggest brands. We're going to have tailgate talk. Always questions from listeners, the, the questions that you have, the ones that we want to answer. It's our favorite segment that we do each and every week. Um, and also with that, we're going to get into some of the combine news and some of the things that are ultimately going on. Plus, uh, however you're consuming this, we appreciate you watching on Bally's. That's awesome. On YouTube, social media, like, subscribe. Um, you know, please continue to comment everything in there. We love the interactions. We're going to start with, uh, we're going to start with some of this combine action, Joshua. And, you know, Caleb Williams didn't do medical exams. Uh, I saw now that Jaden Daniels, Malik neighbors, they didn't do the measurements. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. Did some of the measurements. He's apparently not going to run. There's a lot of stuff here. As we look at this, we'll start with Caleb Williams because you know he's the presumptive number one overall pick, probably going to Chicago to replace Justin Fields as he will most likely be traded here in the very, very near future. Um, when you hear guys like not doing things at the combine and then maybe not doing any of the testing or maybe not wanting to do the medical stuff kind of at all, what are your kind of thoughts with that? It's against my personal nature. Um, you know, I, I always thought about the combine as a setting to be competitive, to, uh, you know, have as much transparency as possible and to answer questions about any doubts that anybody could have. I also understand where these guys are at when you're talked about, you know, being a lock as a top five or a top 10 pick in the NFL draft. Like if I'm Caleb Williams, I don't need 32 doctors, you know, poking and prodding me and, and you know, tugging on my joints and everything like if I'm taking a visit, I know you're a team that can actually get me. We will do the medical evaluations in that setting. If I'm Marvin Harrison Jr., flip on the damn tape. Like, you've seen everything you need to see out of me. Like, I, I don't know what I could prove to you, what you need to confirm, because I've been the same guy basically ever since I stepped on the field. And that's one of the best receivers that we have seen in college football. Um, and, and so I, I understand. Like, I think a lot of guys are at a point right now where they're like, this is a dog and pony show. It's a made for TV production. There aren't a lot of things that they're going to be able to take away because they've already told me that they think I'm one of the best players in the draft. And all they will do is use any information that they find here against me. I'm not going to allow them to do that. Yeah, that is it. And people don't maybe understand that. The NFL, they, they give you a rating or a grade. And then the scouts, their job, Joshua, is to try to nitpick that all the way down. And the rest of the time is them just chopping away. You yeah. know, and my film says this. And if you run faster than they think, we're like, well, maybe you just don't read things well enough. Maybe you weren't playing all that hard. If you run slower, they're like, well, you're not as fast as your film says. We're worried that your skills may not translate to the next level. So I get all of those things. The physical part, the testing. If I'm Marvin Harrison Jr., fine. You don't want to test, that's cool. There might be teams that aren't comfortable with that. And if there's teams that aren't comfortable, you know what? They ultimately, they have to make that decision and weigh in on what their risk tolerance is. And so that's going to be different for every team. I do understand a little bit about Caleb Williams. You don't, there's probably four or five teams that have the chance of drafting you. Yeah. And so with that, like, do I need to go through a medical for all 32? Now, if he goes to teams on his visit, they bring him in and he still chooses not to like, hey, you got to buy sight unseen. That's a red flag. Like, listen, now, like, but I know you don't have any, like, major injuries in your past, but if we're going to invest, like, all of this draft capital and financial capital, and if you're the Bears, like, we're moving off of one guy onto you, buddy, I can't buy a Ferrari by just looking at it in a magazine from, like, <laughs> an unknown dealer. Like, eventually, before I wire you the cash, I'm going to need to see it. I may need to sit in it. We may need to pop the hood. Heck, we might even need to turn that thing on just to yeah. make sure they can drive around the block <laughs> because it, you've got to be able to have some understanding. These guys just can't say, hey, well, if you don't want to draft me, hey, that's cool. Then you know what, man? Maybe you go somewhere else. But the team has to have some level of understanding of what they're buying. It can't just be a buyer beware, you know. Joshua, you worked in real estate before. Yeah. You know, like as his contract, like you're getting everything, all the good and all the bad. Like 
that's fine. I'm not a fifth round pick. I'm going to be the face of your franchise. So there does have to be a little bit of that where you have to understand, maybe I don't need to do the test, but once you get there and you're in that selection set, you're going to need to take a look. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally there for it, right? And I think part of this thought process is the understanding that I have is these guys are not going to make themselves available to everybody, but they're going to make themselves available to the people who they need to be available to. I fully buy into the fact that there are not 32 teams that have the ability to get Caleb Williams right now. There are not 32 teams that need Caleb Williams right now. So 32 teams shouldn't have anything to do with him. I'm perfectly cool with that. But to your point, the Bears, when they call him and they want to go through and, hey, we need this and we need we're going to schedule a workout with you and we're going to bring our doctor. He better be ready to do all of those things for the Chicago Bears. And, and I hope that there's a willingness since he didn't do it for anybody else at the combine. Um, one of the other interesting things that I see, and, and this is like combine silly season for me, is J.J. McCarthy goes through weigh-ins, but he's like, I'm not going to run a 40. And one of the concerns with J.J. is like, this cat's only 205 pounds. You know, he he's he's the, puts no his body at is. risk. Yeah. Okay, he weighs in at like 220, but he's like, I'm not going to run a 40. Because it's water weight. We yeah. like we all know exactly what it is. You're going to eat the, the cheeseburgers. You're going to have the protein shakes. You're going to drink a whole bunch of water before you get on the scale. But you're like, I'm going to be entirely too sluggish to run. Um, and so I think that's also where I go on this back and forth of like, how much do I actually care about what guys look like for the workout or the weigh-in? Because I know that there are particular things that they are trying to prove to people while also saying that I don't need to show you this other thing. Which is ironic about this. I was talking to Jacob Hester on my XM show and like, hey, you know, we wish I would have weighed four pounds more, ran, you know, three hundredths faster than this. And the irony is, it's like you start talking to scouts like, yeah, that probably wouldn't have moved you really at all anyway. <laughs> I mean, unless you go out there and like, hey, you're a four or five guy and you run like a four seven one and maybe right. weigh like 20 pounds heavy or you're really light. If you're kind of within where they think you are, it's just a function of kind of who's available what teams need and how much they like you when it comes to that pick. Now, Marvin, I don't think that he's going to do any of the physical testing. Do you have a problem with that at all? I, he'll do the medical stuff. I think when teams bring him in, but like no pro day, he's just going to run routes. Is that, does that bother you at all seeing that from him? Well, it would have, I, I think a few years ago, I actually don't have as big of an issue with it right now. And especially if a guy's going to go out there, and run routes is why you're, you're getting ready to employ him. Um, there's so much data on guys nowadays, GPS yeah. data, things of that nature. Like if you want to figure out how fast Marv is, you can look at the splits off of the GPS from when he gets off the line of scrimmage to when he hits top speed. And I'm sure there's somebody smart enough in an organization to figure out how that correlates to a 10 yard yeah. split. Absolutely. I'm with you in that. That one thing too, is he's getting a lot of heat because he, I guess, no showed, you know, air quotes, his media obligations, I've subsequently found out, and I think it's been leaked that, hey, he weighed in two days early because he yeah. knew he wasn't going to be there. Yeah. I, I don't understand why the NFL and the combine wouldn't have said, hey, and maybe it was just to keep the ruse up to keep, because it is a TV show, right? but that he's not going to be here now and to make him look a little better as opposed to him just acting like he maybe slept in or wasn't even around. Yeah, can we talk about this whole combine media thing right now? Because the conclusion that I've drawn is that a lot of people have convinced their bosses that there's a lot of good information that they can get out at the NFL Combine when most of them want to sit up at the bar at St. Elmo's and drink. And then when they get to the press conference, they're asking guys, do you think birds are real? They're asking guys, do you believe in outer space? Things of that nature. I, I, what purpose are we really serving right now? I'm with you. I'm with you. We got more Combine news Coming up next, how the Buckeyes have fared. I've got an interesting comp, too, when you talk about someone who didn't run and how their NFL career has gone. We'll get into all that here next on The Bobby Carpenter Show. Welcome back into the program, Efforting Schlegs. You know, he's a squirrely guy out there, you know, in, <laughs> in the wild bush somewhere, maybe at a, at a Waffle House, who knows. When he tells you 15 minutes, it may be 30. So we're tracking him down. I think he's going to join us next segment. So it should be exciting. But talking about guys who haven't didn't work out of the combine. And I don't know if you remember this, Joshua, a guy that, you know, been pretty talented player in the NFL, maybe hasn't had the playoff success yet that they want. And I always say, guys, you don't have to do anything. And my dad was tell, would tell me this all the time growing up. You have your own decisions to make. 
there's always consequences for your actions. So if you choose, you don't want to do medical, you don't want to work out. Maybe there's teams that are comfortable with that. And maybe that hurts you. Now Marvin Harrison Jr., elite human being, he has the pedigree. And so I think he's probably given a lot of grace and a lot of leeway because of all these things, good human, hall of fame, dad, great film, like all this stuff with him. So he's going to get some grace, but I don't know if you remember, you know, Lamar Jackson chose not to run a 40 <laughs> and people were like, Oh my gosh. And I was like the same way. Like, why would you not? My brother was his strength coach, Joshua at Louisville. And my brother, he's one of the fastest dudes I've ever seen. He's strong, tough, all the things. And so he, he didn't run the 40. He t- is taken 32nd by the Baltimore Ravens. They trade up the last pick, I think, or 31st right there at the end. I'm convinced after watching Lamar Jackson play in the NFL if he would have ran a 40, it would have definitely been sub 4-4, four, four, maybe like hot, low 4-3s, high 4-2s, because anytime he's on the field, he looks like one of the one, two, three fastest guys that are out there. So let's say he would have run that 40, Joshua. I think maybe then he might have been taken in the top 20. So as long as you're okay with the inherent risk of it and what it's going to look like, I have no problem with it. You just got to own it. Lamar was fighting such a weird battle, though, where yeah. – like, you know, had he run the 4-3, somebody would have said, that's a wide receiver and not a quarterback, because that's <laughs> what they were trying to say about him exactly. the whole time anyway. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. I, I think, to your point, though, there is a level of risk, right? Like, I think these guys are making a bet on themselves that whatever is shown on tape is going to be the thing that they are judged on, and, and the testing numbers are irrelevant at that point. And for some people, they really do matter. And And I tend to agree with the idea that, Maybe it does bump Lamar up a little bit, but I can see his thought process there where he's like, I'm not going to give them any more reasons to call me a whiteout. Yeah. And I get that. Um, and that, that was, it was like you said, it was a unique thing. And this is a guy who, you know what, he's got some hardware on his shelf yeah. for being one of the best players in the NFL. Really but you know, and you always wonder, and, and it's impossible to know whether how that would impact it. And I can't imagine someone actually trying to change him into a whiteout. Maybe he doesn't go to Baltimore and his right. career is a little different. Um, but we do have a couple of Buckeyes. So I think Marvin's going to be fine. I can't imagine him slopping out, sliding out of the top five or six. Maybe someone takes Malik neighbors over him. If he does everything and they're a little more comfortable with it. Yeah. And like, if, if you're Marvin and you're cool with that, fine. And I don't know if you really want to go to Arizona anyway, you'd probably rather go to someplace that has a little bit better infrastructure and things are a little bit better such situated for success. Um, but Cage Stover, interestingly enough, he, he took to the podium was very, very, I don't know if you heard this clip, Joshua, very, very uh, complimentary of Ryan Day, you know, what he did to him as a coach, how yeah. you know, he impacted the team. And really, he said he's responsible for him playing tight end, and he had to kind of sell him on that. And he's like, I wouldn't be over here if it wasn't for Ryan Day and all the things that he did for me. Yeah, I, I thought that quote really stood out. And it's an interesting thing because I've been critical of Ryan Day. I know a lot of people had been um this past year but I think a lot of the things that you hear from players man there's a there's a reason why uh they've been close right like it's it's because he's put together uh uh, an environment where guys really believe in him and so I think that's a, a thing that should give people faith in what he can do down the line but for Cade Stover too I think there's a lot of maturity in saying I'm gonna do something that I didn't necessarily come here to do and I'm gonna kind of have to start over in the process of doing it Um, But I'm going to have blind faith in this guy who I really trust and I think is a really good coach that is going to be the best thing for my career. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think we talked about this, I believe, last week. He's one of the the guys to me that could be a steal for somebody because it seemed like every time Ohio State needed a play, he was there to make it. And it's like, I mean, just Johnny on the spot, very timely, clutch situations. Um, and that's going to translate. And he's a, a tough, rugged dude, hard-nosed mentality. He's out here massaging cows in preparation for the combine. Like, I love all of it. You know, they, they came out and PFF said he was one of the lowest-graded tight ends, pass blocking and run blocking. You know, you're watching the games. You know, some of the stuff on the bubble screens is tough, blocking guys in space. Yeah. But in-line blocking tight end, Josh, I, I would have thought that he was probably one of the best guys that you're going to find out there in college football. I think technique probably needs to tighten up a little bit. I think you could go through a majority of these tight ends and say that about them when it comes to blocking. Um, And quite frankly, I don't think a lot of these guys in this draft are as willing to block as he is, right? I think there's a willingness component that needs to be factored in that doesn't show up 
in the grades and I'm, I'm sitting here watching the the rerun of the the tight end workout and some of the top guys in this class are glorified wide receivers and there's no knock on that because that's where the NFL is gone but you want a guy who's going to do the dirty work you got it in the stover absolutely uh did a great job Tommy Eichenberg there he's done a pretty good job they talked about him captain losing his last couple games uh those two and then Steel Chambers all live together. So I always like to I bundle them up as kind of like a whole package. They're like a, the little trio, kind of similar to AJ Schlegs and myself. When we played, they got a great little bond. Funny, Steel came in as a running back, left as a linebacker. Cade came in as a linebacker, ultimately left as a tight end. Uh, but Tommy and Steel, I believe, posting two of the top times in their pro agility and watching those guys interact out there during the position drills was a pretty fun experience. It was great. And uh, I don't think either one of them ran 40s either. And considering what they did in, in the shuttle, like, that's what you need to see. Uh, you know, judging linebackers, like, a great, you can run this straight line. How are you in a box situation where you got to change directions and get your feet moving? Both of those guys displayed that they have that change of direction and quickness that you'd like to see. Um, I, I think the that workout specifically for Tommy was a big one uh, because I know people were going to ask questions about his ability to uh, move the way that he needs to at the NFL level, but he's got the quickness there. He does. Both those guys can move pretty well. Tommy being a captain, you know, Kate as well. Um, they asked Tommy this and you get some tough questions. You're trying to prepare for the draft. People are talking about still your, your, not just your performance in college, maybe losing some big games. I think it's pertinent to kind of talk about some of those things. I, uh, talking about losing Michigan, being a captain, um, not maybe playing as well as he would have liked with the injuries and the dislocated shoulder or elbow and everything else. He said, I just know I definitely could have played better. I felt like I let down so many people, really, especially being a captain, too. You know, that's the standard is winning that game. It was very hard for me, but you got to keep moving forward. Um, you know, kind of thoughts on that being asked and kind of his response. I, I love the response. I actually resonate with that response a lot. Um, I think back to 2015 when I was playing and we lost to Michigan State. and It was the last game that I ever played in the horseshoe. And I took that one really hard because I felt like there were signs that we we didn't have everything tightened up as a team. And I felt like I didn't do enough as a captain to lead the guys in, in the right direction to make sure that we wouldn't trip up like that. And so I know uh, as somebody who sees himself as a leader, you're going to think about those things all the time. Um, and it's going to be tough, but, uh, you know, he's got a fresh start here as he transitions into the NFL. And I think this is experience that he can lean on. What did you learn from being one of the go-to guys when you were in college or that will help you in your pro career? Absolutely. And I think that those are the type of guys you want, guys that want yeah. to play, guys are going to play through injuries, guys that care about things a lot. And then, you know, lastly, this response by Caden, you're in a kind of a similar situation, Josh, like your class of guys because you obviously won a national championship in 14. A lot of guys came back that next year, hopes of winning it. Didn't get a chance to ultimately uh, with that Michigan State loss, beat Michigan, go on to ultimately win the bowl game. Uh, asked about Cade Stover playing in that game, like him, like a lot of those guys did, Tommy and Steele as well. Said, my goal wasn't to impress NFL scouts. The goal was to go out there and be with the other guys. Sitting out of that game, I was advised by agents. I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I couldn't go to sleep at night if that if I was going to do that. That's maturity, right? And it's a tough decision. I, I don't blame guys who decide that they want to sit out because yeah. there's money on the line. But when you have that that team culture and you care about the guys that you're around, I understand playing it. And like you said, in, in 15, we played Notre Dame in that bowl game on both sides. Everybody played. And there was a catastrophic injury in there uh, with Jalen Smith. But like guys felt like it was a part of their duty to finish off their career the right way. And I love that for them. Yeah, it's it was a big deal. And to me, like I said, I'm not going to penalize guys for sitting out, but I will give you kind of bonus points. To me, it's like the no bonus question at the end. And if you choose to do that, you're putting some things at risk. But when you start talking, that's why I always put Tommy, Caden, Steele, all those guys playing. They're kind of talking about things before. And like, I can't imagine not playing, like getting a chance to play with your friends and your teammates like one last time. Because when you get to the next level, as you know, as I know, it's just, it's a little bit different. And it's not necessarily the same feeling that you had before. So awesome for those guys talking about that and their experiences there. Great to see those guys perform. Excited to see them go play on Pro Day and what they're going to be able to do here uh, before the NFL draft. Uh, got some other big news coming up, and I think we're going to be joined by our guy, Anthony Schlegel, 
here coming up next on the Bobby Carver Show. All right, welcome back into the show. And just like a chupacabra appearing in the West Texas (laughs) desert, Anthony Schlegel jumps out, explodes onto the screen. We've got the Arnold Classic going on this week. Columbus Schlegs. I mean, it's a full-on meatball fest. You just celebrated, if I'm not mistaken, your 43rd birthday on March 1st. How about that? I mean, tons of things going on. Yeah, lots of things going on. The Arnold, um, you know, I... um... The executive vice president at the the armory down off of uh, Kinnear by the Lennox. And uh, it was awesome to have everybody in because that's, listen, you know, I think in the in the fitness world, in the training world, people get caught up in the different segments, right? Powerlifting, bodybuilding, um, CrossFit, HIT. I, listen, I don't care. You know, honestly, we should all be celebrating people that are being fit because we have a pandemic in this country that people aren't fit. So wherever you are in that journey, whatever age you are, like we want to celebrate that. So that really, that's kind of what the RL needs to be about. We all should have a little bit of meatheadness in us because we need to physically all be better. That's called quality of life. So that being said, I celebrate that. We had some big time people just ran, like randomly come in like, hey, we work out here. And one of them's a five time Mr. Olympia and C bum. And like, I, you know, I followed a little bit. Like I grew up in Ronnie Coleman's heyday at Metroflex gym. Lightweight. And, Branch, and he, yeah, lightweight, baby. Yeah, no, but a peanut. I mean, like all the sayings that I got, I got from Brian Dobson and Ronnie Coleman. It's just a fact, because when you're in there every <laughs> single day and you're 14 years old and Ronnie comes in the gym with this really skinny, I mean, his back, like he had to go sideways through the door and he's wearing <laughs> these like black and yellow, like Zumba looking pants, fanny pack. Um, Really nice, skinny, but all all tank tops on him look skinny. So, but then he's just doing the stack of lap pull downs with like forty fives on it for twenty. It's like, you know, um, that's what I grew up with. So, like, I I love it. And and really, the other thing too that people got to take away from all sports, and I'm talking like football and the training for professional athletes at all different levels, it's the attitude and intensity and intent of which you train. And like, that's something that we should all celebrate, regardless of whatever it is that we're doing. Right. So, you know, that's how I view fitness. Um, and it's just something to, uh, that I appreciate about people that like to get bumpy. Absolutely. Schlegs. Uh, how did we celebrate the birthday though? I mean, we got a little waffle house. Is that where we're at Roman or out earlier today? Yeah. So yesterday finished up uh, with the Buckeyes and then, and then went to the armory and was doing some stuff and looking at some, some things for, our youth strength and conditioning program of like, uh, like programming for them, uh, you know, team builder, there's a new company called fit that's out there. I'm looking into those different things. And cause we also want to give the general population opportunities of furthering their journey. And you could do that gem pop. in that like capacity, that. the gym pop, right? <laughs> um, okay. We all got to get better. We all got different things. And when you think about it in strength and conditioning, like I, I'll talk like myself, I, I would be in a hamstring growing bucket right now. Uh, and again, like I love to do things that I love to do. The problem is that, as Louis Simmons says, weak things break. So, hey, Schlakes, it's great that you can do 500 pounds for five on an RDL. That's awesome. But you know what? My hamstrings aren't strong. So guess what? Do more knee-dominant hamstring work. I'd be in a hamstring bucket of that, right? My growing. It's like, you know, I'm feeling a little something. I'm 43. I still like to squat heavy. I did 500 for a triple the other day. I'm feeling kind of frothy. But there's still improvement, and I feel it at the bottom in that area, so that's more interior chain, and it's a growing program. Weak things break, so let's freaking go. But um, So I did that. Then my wife's like, you know what? It's your birthday. I booked you a ticket. I was like, okay. So I flew back to Jacksonville, and then my daughter was like, Dad, let's go to Waffle House for your birthday. So we went to Waffle House. I had the all-star special with an extra waffle. Uh, yeah. It was fantastic, and I, I, I could probably pass out right now. That's, that's Josh Perry approved is what I'm getting here, oh. Joshua. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Waffle House. I, there's not a Waffle House. I don't know if there's one in the state of Illinois. There's certainly not one in the city of Chicago. So every time I get back to the central Ohio area, I go up to Delaware right off 3637. It's the home oh, Waffle yeah. House for your boy. And I uh, throw down. Joshua, you hear all these these lifting with Schlags, you know, Ronnie Coleman, who, by the way, Schlags, Ronnie Coleman's in Columbus. I saw him at the Arnold. I mean, he, I he's in pretty bad, pretty rough shape. But 
I mean, Joshua, we got a good like lifting story with Schlegs when he was training you up back in the day. Uh, best thing about Schlegs, he he just talked about uh, you know, hitting some some heavy squats. It was the back slap. There's oh. not a better back slapper in the country oh. than Anthony Schlegel. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate that because I think that that's one misconception about back slaps. Uh, I got a PhD in back slaps, by the way, uh, oh, really? from Metroflex Gym. Well, there's a certain <laughs> way I've seen. I've seen people, you know, they like the gorilla slap on the side of the like on the back, right? I I don't like there. There, it, it's really it's hard and it's like mm-hmm. it's 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 that, mm-hmm. but it has to be right in the middle of your trap because that's where the middle of the bar goes. And it instantaneously, like CNS is on fire. You're like, holy, you know, and guys try to brace up for it. So I'll be there and I'll like rub the back of their head. Like, like they don't, they don't know that it's coming. I'm just like, you know, and then finally, finally, they realize, boom. And then they're like, boom, and they're under the bar. And they just get your, it gets your stuff going, man. I mean, I'm fired every up right great now. lift I've ever had in my entire life. Backslide. <laughs> All right. We haven't talked to you. Final question here for you, man. Uh, the Buckeye Cruise. Yeah. Back from there. I mean, you survived it. Um, you had your anniversary right before it, birthday right after it. A lot of stuff going on. I mean, how did you survive? How did you navigate the 17th edition of the Buckeye Cruise? Right, let me tell you something. Um, one, I, I, I survived it with you. It, it wasn't a survival. These are things like, I've been on 15 because I forgot that I missed one when I took the job at Ohio State in 2011. Um, I missed the first one because we had our oldest. I brought my daughter on this time so she could get community service hours for the Bright Futures program down here. It's a hell of a way to get service hours, by the way. It is. No doubt. No doubt. (laughs) And, um, you know, but she also needs to see the philanthropic side of her parents and the service mentality of everybody there uh, from travel partners and the James and what they do, but also, you know, too much is given, much is required. And there's a lot of people that donate to this cause. And we've also made lifelong friendships from the crews and that family of Chris and Lisa that they've done. And now it's expanded and you do $4.4 million, not necessarily all on the ship, but throughout the culmination of a year. And I was telling the guys on, on, on the ship, because we now through NIL have the ability of bringing on current players, which I think is fantastic. Because they have to learn, like, hey, listen, man, there's all guys being dudes and, and girls being dudettes. You know, it doesn't matter. But there's a lot of people on that ship that you're going to have lifelong friendships with. And and I think, like, this is a great opportunity to go out and just dialogue with people that want to get to know you more as a person and not just a Buckeye football player. And these are also people that can help you down the road in your life, whether in business or just seeking wisdom because of the different things that they do. So it was, it was a phenomenal trip. We raised a ton of money, and boom! As soon as we got off, I had to go. I, as soon as we got off, I drove back to Jacksonville, dropped my daughter off. George drove to Valdosta, Georgia, and watched my oldest play in a baseball tournament. Let me tell you, South Georgia baseball stadiums are absolutely amazing. Oh, <laughs> you know sure they're they're goodness. like Division One F. Yeah, of facilities. course. Well, Slags, we're up against it. We appreciate you stopping by. Enjoy the rest of your birthday weekend. I know you'll be getting bumpy with Steph and having a great time. Enjoy it, buddy. Thanks for the time. Appreciate you guys. All right. Coming up next, rule changes in college football. What do those look like? Josh and I dive in here on the Bobby Carver Show. All right. We are back in here the Bobby Carver Show. Our guy Schlegs, who knows? We had to cut him loose like a, like a dog that wouldn't walk on a leash. He needed to go roam free. Uh, but, Joshua, there are some – Changes coming to college football. Now, the big sign-stealing situation with Michigan, well, there was an easy solution to that. It was player-to-coach helmet communication. And so that's a rule that's going to get fixed where they're going to be able to do that. Um, they're going to have two-minute warnings now, each half in college football. Tablets on the sideline, which they're going to be able to have moving videos. NFL, they still just have stills. But if you look at high schools around the country, Joshua – they have 55-inch TVs on the side that they're getting instant feedback and watching when they come over there. And those are kind of the three big things that they're going to try to implement this year in 2024. Yeah, the uh, the helmet comms, I'm, I'm very curious to see how teams implement it because I think there is a thought process among college coaches that 
it's more about volume of plays and quality of plays for some of these programs because they know that they're going to have some zero one yard gains. They might have some negative plays, but if they run enough plays, they're going to be able to hit the 20s, and 30s, and 40s, and 50s. Um, and so having to huddle so your quarterback can get a play in there and having every it, it takes time, right? There's a mechanic that goes along with it. Some of these guys have never really been in the system where they've had the huddle. Some of these guys are going to hate when their coach is on the headset and they give them the play. And as they're trying to spit the play out in the huddle, the coach has said, hey, you know, if we got the safety and he's off the hash, this is what the check is going to be. Hey, but, you know, if we got this, this is what the check is going to be. You know, if you see this in the front and you're like, dude, shut up. I'm trying to tell what the play is to the guys in the huddle. So I'm curious to see how all of that comes together. But it's something that we've needed to, to have because it feels antiquated to not have that technology when it's available Two minute warning, I think, is going to be an interesting one too, because now you got to teach guys how to strategize around that. Um, and then ultimately, I feel bad. Well, I feel bad for Mario Cristobal. Mario Cristobal couldn't even manage the normal clock with just that's, being able to kneel it out. Now you're gonna have guys like, I'm hey, saying. there's 20 seconds left. If we call a timeout here, we can run another play. We get the punt. If there's more than two minutes left, then we can run a play. We have the two minute warning. There's going to be so much on these coaches head like i don't know if you'll be able to really call plays anymore i know ryan day just brought in chip kelly and that's going to help because the management of all of this clock situation it's it's a higher level especially for guys who've never had to do it like this it's a lot of teaching yeah like that's that's the other part about it is like in the nfl i think you can do some of the things that like the game can can be taught at a, a different level because it's your job it's all you do all day all, you meet all day long in the league in college, they're like, all right, 20 hours, figure it out, and it better be good. And it's like, that's, that's kind of tough. It's kind of tough. And so, like, yeah, I think you're going to spend more time in training camp going over the mechanics of how to utilize a two-minute warning uh, in situations where it could hurt you, where it could help you, then teams are going to want to have to spend. You're going to need, like, literally in the summer football class to talk mm -hmm. about all the situations, things that go on. And then the other thing with the helmet communication I always found is interesting – did you play linebacker, Joshua? Did you ever have the green dot? I had the green dot. Yeah. So the green dot, so the coach, you get some older dudes, like they're yelling the play to you, which, by the way, it's like sounding like this when it's coming through. I mean, like it's like a two-way radio, like transistor <laughs> radio. It's not a – like it's not iPhone quality coming into <laughs> you your You don't ear. have AirPods in there. They're talking to you. You can't talk back. And the other thing, too, like they'll be yelling at a you, and then they start yelling at another player like – with what's going on without depressing the button or releasing the button. And then the interesting piece in the NFL, it cuts off at 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. I assume that that's going to be part of this rule. So you I think I read that. Yeah. Up to the minute, the final seconds before it goes. And if that's the case, like defense, you got to get it in there. You're going to have to get the call out and the quarterbacks, but you're not going to be able to have this offense where then you look to the side, the scans, the scans, because unless you're going to continue to signal, which would defeat yeah. the purpose of the helmet, yeah. I don't understand how you're going to be able to make those adjustments. I think there are a lot of teams that are just going to say, screw the 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 walkie talkie. And again, it's like even the idea of some teams think they can go faster because they yeah. they don't have to flip the wide receivers and those guys just stand and they can see what's being signaled in instead of having to come to a huddle. But now we're not going to signal in. It's like the whole, everything yeah. mechanically is going to be different. I'm curious to see how it's utilized. Yeah. It's it, there's going to be a lot of obviously operations that are going to need to be put into place. So you have to, you have to practice this. And that's the other thing is in the NFL, like on Thursdays or Fridays, different things during the season, they would literally practice signaling it in so that you got used to the operations of maybe your coordinators in the box tells it to the coach on the sideline. He's the one with the microphone. He then puts it out to the players, and there's ops that need to happen. And I know this about uh, coaches at any level, Joshua, especially college in the NFL. They're not great at with change. No. You know, especially with the tablets, going from the tablets to the still pictures. We saw Bill Belichick throw the tablet on the ground last <laughs> year. These guys get furious about that. And I think the tablet thing is maybe like 18 tablets, which – between the sideline and the box, which sounds about right. You know, the guys can go over there and see some of the stills. But they, one of the rules is, Joshua, you can't ca you can't cast it onto a TV, a bigger bigger viewing <laughs> surface, which I would have paid money to see some of these older coaches try to air draw Apple Play. <laughs> and, 
pass hey, it up there. You got to airplay it. Oh. And they're trying to figure out how to enter in the passcode oh, so they gosh. can get it up on the big screen. <laughs> it would have been remarkable. It would uh. have been remarkable. I think this will ultimately be good. But this season, there's going to be a lot of teaching. And there's going to be games. I think there will be at least 10 to 15 games that will be won or lost due to the inability to manage <laughs> time, yeah. clock, new rules, and things. So – We'll dive into that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we get our favorite segment coming up next. It's Tailgate Talks. It's your questions answered by Joshua and I coming up here next on The Bobby Carpenter Show. Welcome back into The Bobby Carpenter Show. We got Tailgate Talk. It's brought to you by... Tipico Sportsbook. It's going to change the way you bet with their new Tipico Rewards program. The more you bet, the more you can earn and win. And to celebrate this, Big Play is holding our own company-wide contest to see which of our shows can climb the leaderboard and prove they are the best bettors at Big Play. The winning show may even give out some bet credits to their listeners each month. How great does that sound? So be sure to follow along with all your favorite big play personalities on social media to lock in bets with us all week long. I'm telling you this. Anthony Rothman was my foray into gambling, Joshua, probably five years ago. And I know far more about it now than I ever thought I would. And I love it. Getting in on the props, the parlays. There's a lot of great things you can. So I feel pretty confident in this show. Uh, must be 21 years or older to gamble. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Uh, got some questions here coming in. Um, and this is kind of interesting, coming from Kevin White on Twitter. Uh, will this year's college football champ be perceived differently than others? And I think that's with regard to the expanded field now, and it's maybe not as truncated of a process. The bigger the field probably less chance of the truest best champion. Yeah, it's I think it's an interesting thing like in the 14 playoff and you know that was part of the Ohio State team that uh won the first ever 14 playoff. I think that people did kind of look at it differently because you had to go through a couple of rounds to win the championship. But I I tend to lean into what you're saying there with the 12 team playoff is like certainly you might get the upset in the first round and uh you know then you're playing a team that people are like, you know, they got the upset, but do we really believe in them ends up being kind of a nasty game? Uh, so on and so forth. So I, I think the narratives are, are going to come out about how people have won the championship, who they had to go through to actually win it. But the reality of the situation is a lot of things can go wrong during college football season. So if you're able to make it through a 12 team playoff and win a championship, I think you should get all the flowers. I believe that uh, one of the other elements, the more games you play, the greater risk of injury and in football mm -hmm. more so than other sports. It's not necessarily like basketball where like March Madness, six games, very rarely are you seeing a serious injury happen in the, in the tournament um, that could impact it overall. Uh, you look at back when I think Georgia won their first, I want to say, and that was when Jamison Williams and oh goodness, uh, Mechie both went down for Alabama. Yeah. And so, they're able to beat them, you know, in the SEC championship. Uh, would that have happened had Mechie and Jamo been healthy? Like, I don't know. I mean, they looked pretty good early. I, I don't think that that probably would have happened. And so the more games you had, the more chance of injury. You do deserve all the flowers because it's incredibly tough to win in football in one-off games. But, you know, as far as truest champion, I think you probably have a pretty good argument right now that, out of whatever the decade or so that you had the four team playoff, probably the best team has won it 85 to 90% of the time. And I would say that that is probably about as unique as you can get in sports, unless you're going to play seven game series, which in football obviously just isn't functionally. Can't do it. Ability. You can't do it. So, yeah. I think it's, it, it is intriguing there. Um, and the injury thing, I, I just hope that it it's not something that is prevalent because that would be a real big issue for me. It would. Um, question here uh, coming about the defensive side. Uh, I see Sonny Styles as a Micah Parsons type player. Any chance we see more of that from him this year? Um, starting off, I think that he's going to get some run this spring at linebacker, especially with Caleb Downs coming in. How they choose to deploy him, Joshua, that's going to be really interesting with James Laronitis. And he even said, I think he made the uh, 
Isaiah Simmons comparison, who was the great linebacker at Clemson, who did a lot. Yeah, I think that would be more of the the comp for me. Um, you know, Isaiah Simmons, maybe even like a Kyle Hamilton ish, but he wasn't a guy who was in the box a ton. But somebody who's got the the range of a safety, uh, but has the the body of a linebacker. You know, you could play him in the box. I don't necessarily see the Micah Parsons comp because I just don't know what Sonny Styles would be yeah. as a pass rusher. Um, and I'm not exactly sure that's what they want to do with him, considering you know some of the bodies that they have up front anyway to rush the passer. So um, I think it is it is really important to have a guy with that level of versatility. We had Darren Lee uh, when I was playing, and, and he was obviously a dude who, you know, was a linebacker by name, but certainly played out there in the slot a lot. Uh, it was a guy who we knew could run sideline to sideline. It makes a difference in how you can uh, structure your game plans defensively. So I think like Darren and Sonny, both of those guys were kind of the DB in the linebacker hybrid where you look yeah. at Micah Parsons, he's kind of the linebacker in the D line hybrid. Now maybe Sonny can grow into that, but I never like to ask guys to jump and like do the skip pass in basketball. Like <laughs> let's learn. Cause it's a big difference playing closer to the box. Yeah, you it is. I mean, I was a guy who played safety in high school a little bit. I mean, it took a year playing linebacker. Like, Hey, these guys are close. I've got to hit everything happens hit. fast. Yeah. I can't use athleticism as much. I've got to be really succinct in my footwork because the closer you are to the ball, the less chance you have to actually recover to be able to from false steps and everything else. So I think they'll probably ease Sonny in, you know, maybe in the fourth year, he's big enough, he's strong enough because he definitely has the physical ability to continue to grow. Then maybe they start to do that. But I think this first year, if you can get him to be a really good outside linebacker, I think you've got yourselves one heck of a defense. So I never, and he can be a great blitzer and a lot of things, but I don't know if you necessarily want to have him like standing up on the edge just quite yet because a guy going from covering slot receivers <laughs> to rushing on 320 pound tackles, like that is, that's a world of difference. You see those, de those uh, corners, Joshua, and they get the, uh, the tackle pulling around. Those dudes aren't f hatting and shedding. They're usually diving at a leg to, to try to create a pile. You got to get low, low yeah. man wins, especially when you're a small dude. Absolutely. All right, coming up, we'll wrap up the show. Justin Fields looking like he's out of Chicago. They've got some odds out on where he's going to start the season. We'll take a look at that next. What we think the best fit will be for Justin Fields right here on the Bobby Carpenter Show. One heck of a big show today. Thank you, my man, Joshua Perry. He's been doing a fantastic job. So you're joined by my guy, Anthony Schlegel, hopping in, sharing some of his great stories here. Like I said, if you're watching on Bally's, thank you. If you're watching on social media, YouTube, whatever it is, like, subscribe, leave comments. We love to interact. Tailgate Talk, which we just had, is our favorite segment each and every week. But before we get out of here, Justin Fields played really well, I thought, this year, Joshua, especially the back two-thirds of the year. Drug his team to seven and nine. Really didn't have a lot of blocking up front. Not a ton of weapons on the outside. And you look at his performance, it, it can still improve. He's not a finished product, but you want to see him in a consistent system with weapons around him. And he played himself out of getting traded. Unfortunately, the Bears have the Carolina Panthers pick, and Bryce Young wasn't able to do the same. So the Bears have the number one overall pick, possibly or probably taking uh Caleb Williams now at this point now there's some odds here where Justin Fields could go the betting favorite by a mile right now minus 425 is the Atlanta Falcons how do you feel about him going back home Joshua I mean one of the things that we had talked about uh in terms of Justin Fields is the lack of weapons that he had in Chicago you drop them in Atlanta they got weapons everywhere young dudes that can really play. And so I like that just from a, uh, you know, what's around him standpoint. I think any team that's going for Justin Fields is going because they know that they're going to structure an offensive system that they feel like can really fit what his biggest skill sets are. And I think that's what he needs to be in um, as a player there. And, and I think that's what he lacked in Chicago. They went through coordinator changes, had a head coach change in there. They got a new coordinator even this year. That's a mess for him. I don't want to see that. So I think the best thing for him is to be somewhere else. I mean, honestly, if if Jalen Hurts can have the success that he had in the NFL, I think he is comparably athletically, and I think he has a better arm, a more accurate arm than Hurts. So 
Hopefully they put some stuff around them. The Bears are the second betting favorite at plus 240. Steelers have gotten a lot of interest as well, plus 380. Both the Steelers and, and Falcons, good teams, just really don't have that quarterback position locked down. And as we know, it's really stinking hard to win in the NFL if you don't have that. Raiders at plus 1,200. Giants at plus 18. Patriots at plus 2,200, which I heard there was a little smoke maybe for him going there as they potentially are looking to upgrade that position with either him, maybe Baker Mayfield. But thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Bobby Carpenter Show as we begin to wrap this thing up. My man Joshua Perry here with us. Another big week. Wrap up the combine, preview the draft, and spring ball is on the horizon.